The lens, as you all know, is a transparent crystalline biconvex structure. Its uh, shape has also been referred to as an ob asymmetric oblate spheroid, like uh, what Dr. Farzana explained before. It is positioned, as you can see in the figure, in the posterior chamber in a saucer-shaped depression termed as the patella fossa. And it is suspended by the ciliary zonules here. And posteriorly, it is attached to the vitreous in a, uh, by a circular ligament known as the Vigus ligament. And um, it creates a space here. The attachment creates a space here known as the Burgers space. So the unique thing about the uh, lens is that it continues to grow throughout life and it does not possess any blood or nerve supply. So coming to some of the important dimensions of the lens. So the lens has got both an anterior and posterior curved surface. The anterior surface is less convex than the posterior. And the center of these surfaces is referred to as the anterior and posterior pole. The distance between the poles is measured as the anteroposterior diameter or thickness. So the importance of this dimension is that as the lens grows in size, um, grows uh, with age, it is this dimension that increases in size. Then coming to the next important dimension that is equator. So equator is generally measured from the nasal to the temporal aspect. And uh, equator actually refers to the marginal circumference of the lens. It is about 6.5 millimeters at birth and it increases to about nine to, nine to 10 millimeters in adult life. And after that, it remains constant. So a few points uh, regarding the embryology. The lens development begins as early as the first month of gestation. It is supplied by the hyaloid artery, which forms a network of capillaries, especially over the posterior surface, known as the tunica vasculosa lentis. So this structure eventually regresses towards late gestation, but uh, uh, you can see remnants of these in, uh, on the posterior lens capsule as dot-like opacities. Here you can see this is the Mittendorf's dot, or sometimes you can see them as pigmented small, pigmented small uh, lens uh, opacities over the anterior lens capsule. These are the epicapsular stars. Now, these are examples of other developmental anomalies. Here you have the lenticonus, where you get a conical protrusion of the lens surface. This is anterior protrusion and this is posterior protrusion. Now here you have the lens coloboma, where you get a defect in the a sectoral defect in the margin of the lens with associated zonules. This is typical uh, uh, inferior location with the uh, iris coloboma. So this is another anomaly. Now coming to the uh, lens anatomy, it is composed of the lens capsule, epithelium and lens fibers. The unique thing about this uh, lens capsule is that it is the thickest basement membrane in the body. And it is thickest near the equator where you have the attachment of the ciliary zonules and thinnest at the posterior pole. So this thin nature of the posterior pole makes it vulnerable to tear and rent formation at the time of cataract surgery. It also possesses a high, highly elastic property, which is uh, especially evident in uh, children and young adults. So these properties of the lens uh, should be kept in mind while performing continuous curvilinear capsular excess or any other capsulotomy procedures at the time of cataract surgery. So coming to the lens epithelium, over the anterior surface of the lens, you have the simple cuboidal epithelium that secrete the lens capsule throughout life. Then towards the equator and pre-equator, you have the germinal zone. Here you get actively dividing cells, which uh, with a high mitotic activity, which elongate and form the columnar E cells. So the clinical significance of this is that very often remnants of these cells following cataract surgery can migrate posteriorly and proliferate, leading on to posterior capsular opacification. Like you can see here in this figure, this is Elschnick pearls and this is a fibrous uh, type of opacification. So the E cells, they differentiate finely to form the lens fibers. And these fibers are concentrically arranged uh, in an onion layer kind of pattern with the older layers towards the center and newer fibers on the outermost aspect. 
here you can see the lens sutures being formed here, uh, both anterior and posterior, due to the interdigitation of the anterior and posterior tips of the lens fibers. So these are the y, uh, y sutures. The lens may be divided into different zones based on the time period during which each uh, layer is formed. So here you have the outermost cortex, which is uh, of a softer consistency and which is composed of recently formed fibers. And you have a central nucleus, which is of a harder consistency. And the innermost part of this uh, nucleus is the embryonic nucleus, which is laid during the first to three, uh, third month of gestation. Then surrounding it, you have the fetal nucleus, followed by the infantile nucleus, and then the adult nucleus. Then in between the two, you have another intermediate zone, uh, that is the epinucleus. So the anatomical uh, aspects uh, of this uh, lens zone units are important while performing hydro procedures at the time of cataract surgery. This is hydro dissection where you have the jet of fluid uh, injected just beneath the capsule, cleaving the capsule from the rest of the nucleus. And here in hydro delineation, the fluid is injected into the lens matter, cleaving the nucleus from the epinucleus. So this, uh, uh, these features are also important uh, in congenital cataract, where you typically, typically get cataract changes affecting the zone of formation at the time of insult. So coming to the biochemical composition, so a major part of the lens is, uh, consists of water, that is 64%, and 35% uh, is protein. And the unique thing here is that the protein content is highest among the body tissues. And it consists of the uh, two fractions, that is the water-soluble fraction, which consists of the crystallins, the alpha, beta, gamma crystallins, and the water-insoluble fraction, which is uh, mainly the membrane proteins. So it is seen that with age and especially in nuclear cataract, the percentage of this water insoluble proteins increases. Now lens pump mechanism is another important uh, feature of the lens, which maintains the water and electrolyte balance across its membranes and keeps the lens less hydrated. So these are the uh, important anatomical features that maintain the transparency of the lens. So to add to it is the lens pump mechanism and also the antioxidant properties of glutathione, ascorbic acid, and vitamin E, which prevent oxidative stress and uh, protein denaturation. So derangements in these mechanisms can lead on to lens opacification and cataract. So here you can see the types of uh, senile cataract, the nuclear cataract, the cortical cataract, and the posterior subcapsular. Now, these are examples of cataract in systemic diseases, in diabetes, the rosette cataract in trauma, in Wilson's disease, and in galactosemia. So coming to the next uh, uh, subtopic that is on lens zonules. So the lens zonules, they originate from the past planar, about 1.5 millimeters from the ora serrata. And along its course, it can be divided into the pars orbicularis, the zonular plexus, then you have the zonular fork that is at the site of the ciliary processes. From here, the fibers, they uh, interdigitate in the three limbs, that is the anterior, equatorial, and posterior. Then they insert at discrete points on the lens capsule, about 1.5 millimeters anterior and about 1.25 millimeters posterior to the equator. Here you can see that the zonules are again divided into secondary zonules. And close to the ciliary body, you have the tension zonules. And these, ha these have an important role in accommodation. Then out here, you have the hyloid zonules, which, connect, uh, which are connected to the anterior hyloid phase. So these zonules are arranged in bundles of uh, two to five fibers. And these fibers are again composed of microfibrils and are rich in fibrillin. So the clinical significance here is that mutations in the fibrillin gene can occur in Marfan syndrome, which typically causes a suprotemporal subluxation of the lens, as you can see here. Now, in homocystin urea, you get an inferior subluxation of the lens with disintegration of the zonules. 
Now this is microsphere of Ikea with a small globular lens, well seen on um, in the dilated state, and this um, it predisposes to pupil block glaucoma. Now here, this is pseudo exfoliation with uh, the regenerated zonules here, and this is the oil droplet appearance of an anterior subluxated clear lens. So coming to the uh, angle of anterior chamber. So the angle of anterior chamber, it, it's actually a recess formed between the posterior surface of cornea and the anterior surface of the iris, bounded from anterior to posterior by the Schwalbe's line, then the trabecular meshwork followed by scleral spur and posterior most the ciliary body band. Now coming to the aqueous humor outflow, it uh, mainly occurs, uh, that is in 83 to 96%, it is through the conventional pathway. That is the outflow occurs to the trabecular meshwork into the episcleral and subconjunctival veins. And in five to 15%, it drains out into the supracoroidal and the supraciliary space. So coming, uh, let us uh, take up each structure in detail. That is the Schwalbe's line. So it, it represents the termination of decimates membrane. And on gonioscopy, it can be seen as a fine white ridge just anterior to the trabecular meshwork. And it is better identified when you do the corneal wedge technique of gonioscopy, where the, and, where the anterior and posterior corneal beams meet. So pigmentation is very uh, common here because this represents the point of transition from the scleral to the corneal curvature. Now here you can see the pigmentation anterior to the Schwalbe's line. This is, uh, is in a scalloped manner. This is the sample SE line, which is a feature of uh, pseudo exfoliation syndrome and sometimes also seen in pigment dispersion syndrome. Now this is the anterior displaced Schwalbe's line or posterior embryotoxon, which is a feature of anterior segment dysgenesis and it's also seen in 10% of the normal population. So coming to the next structure, the trabecular meshwork is a sieve-like structure that is located between the Schwalbe's line and the scleral spur. It is a pale tan to dark brown in color on gonioscopy, and the pigmentation varies with age, race, and pigment dispersion. It is divided into three portions. The innermost, you have the uveal meshwork that is shaded in blue. Then you have the uh, corneoscleral meshwork that is the middle layer shaded in uh, red. And the innermost, you have the juxtacanalicular uh, tissue. I'm sorry, the outermost. Then outer to that, you have the Schlem's canal. So the uveal meshwork, as you can see here, the uh, trabeculae are arranged in rod or co uh, co cord or rope-like manner with large pores for the aqueous outflow. Here you can see iris processes on gonioscopy. These are actually the extensions of the uveal meshwork and very often it is mistaken for peripheral anterior synecate. Now, with corneal scleral meshwork, the trabecular sheets have smaller elliptical pores and they decrease in size as you go to the deeper layers. The ultra structure of the trabecular meshwork, so both these layers have a common structure, that is they have, a, uh, it is composed of uh, four concentric layers, the central core of connective tissue consisting of collagen, followed by elastic fiber layer, glass membrane layer, and the finally enclosed by the endothelial cell layer. So this endothelial cell layer is important because um, it, uh, it has important properties. It is joined by leaky gap junctions for the flow of aqueous and also possesses contractile and phagocytic functions. So the outermost is the juxta canalicular tissue. It provides the most resistance to aqueous outflow. And it again, uh, it, uh, unlike the other two, it has got three layers, the trabecular endothelium on the inside the middle layer of connective tissue and the Schlem's endothelium on the out, outside. So again here, this has got significant morphological features like giant vacuoles and pores with leaky gap junctions, which enable both a transcellular and a paracellular outflow of aqueous. So the trabecular outflow system is characterized by a aqueous outflow pump driven by flexible trabecular movements, phagocytosis, fibrinolytic activity and hence overall it behaves as a self-cleaning filter. So derangements in these mechanisms lead on to uh, pathologies like primary open angle glaucoma, steroid induced glaucoma, etc. 
So next structure uh, outermost to the trabecular meshwork is the Schlem's canal. Now this is an endothelial line channel with a diameter of about 190 to 350 microns that runs circumferentially around the globe. It has a single lumen, but occasionally it can form a plexus. So here it is perforated on the outer aspect by 25 to 35 aqueous collector channels, which are drained to the episcleral uh, plexus by a complex system of intrascleral channels. So coming to the clinical aspect, blood reflex in Schlem's canal is an important feature of raised episcleral venous pressure, which is seen in CCF and AV fistula. Here, what you see on gonioscopy is a red band across the trabecular meshwork, as uh, you see here in this uh, picture. Then anatomy of the Schlem's canal is also important while performing glaucoma surgeries like trabeculotomy, canaloplasty, and viscocanalostomy. So the scleral spur is the next structure posterior, and it is seen as a prominent white line between the ciliary body band and the trabecular meshwork. So finally, posterior most, you have the ciliary body band. On gonioscopy, it is seen as a gray or dark brown band, and the width depends upon the point of iris insertion. So it is wide in myopes and narrow in uh, hypermetropes. And here you can see the irregular widening, which, is, uh, which occurs here due to the tears between the ciliary body muscle fibers following traumatic angle recession. Now, this is uh, a cyclodialysis cleft here. Uh, this occurs due to disinsertion of the ciliary body at the scleral spur. And um, this is uh, visualized as a cleft with the uh, sclera visible underlying, uh, underneath that. And it often leads on to hypotony due to increased uveoscleral outflow. So uh, we've come to the end of the presentation. It is difficult to cover all the clinical aspects in, due to the short of time. I hope this presentation will stimulate you in further elaborate reading of the topics.